Good morning. I think I'm on, right? Yep. It's good to see you all. It's good to see so many up in the balcony. My goodness. You're, you're actually taking those first two sermons of the year seriously. <laughs> it's good to be with the gathered church every week, right? It's good to have that as a discipline and a life resolution. I will be with the gathered church every week I can possibly be there. In fact, the, the, the star pupil this morning is none other than our associate pastor. Will, where are you sitting? Where, there he is, way in the back. I mean, he tore his Achilles on Monday, had surgery on Tuesday. He did take his little card and write in 52 weeks out of 52, so that's why he's here this morning. And so the word for you all is, unless you tear both Achilles tendons... <laughs> Unless you lose both of your kidneys or, you know. But no, it's great to see you all. This is the week where uh, all the little, little guys and gals are with us. So just realize that they're here with us this morning. It's an opportunity for them to learn how to, you know, worship with their family. It's also an opportunity for parents to kind of guide them and discipline them and teach them how to, how to worship with God's people and to sit and listen and all those good things, so it's a part of the, the learning process for kids to go through. So we're glad that they're with us this morning. Let's pray together as we prepare for God's word. We love you, Lord. It's been good to worship you already. It's always good to gather with the saints. We just confess to you that we need you. We need to meet with you. We need your presence. And I pray that you would use me and uh, that my mouth could be a vessel for you to use to convey truth and to encourage the saints. And we ask that the Holy Spirit would be our teacher. And we might leave here in some way changed because we've met with you and we've heard from your, from your word. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. <clears throat> so a time for true confessions as we start this morning. How many of you ever used Cliff's Notes in either high school or college to either prepare for an exam or to write a term paper? Pretty fair show of hands. And some of you didn't raise your hands, probably should have, but uh, you know, you can get them on virtually anything. And so you, you, you'd never finished To Kill a Mockingbird, but you had an exam on it. And so the night before you ran to the college bookstore and grabbed a copy of the Cliff's Notes and, or Anatomy and Physiology. You slept through that 8 a.m. class on anatomy and now the exam is tomorrow and so you do all that you can to cram it in. Did you know that you can get Cliff's Notes on the Bible, the entire Bible, or just the Old Testament or just the New Testament? And so if you want to cram for some uh, class, one of our Bible classes, you might want to pick up a Cliff's Notes and do your studies. Let me ask you a question. What about the gospel? Not the Bible, not the New Testament, not the Old Testament. What about the gospel? If, if you had to come up with one, maybe two verses that served as your Cliff's Notes for the gospel, what would it be? There are several lists. J.I. Packer came up with a, a list of about 15 or 20 sample verses that you could use if you just needed to give somebody a summary of the gospel. Uh, I've listed several of them up on the screen. 1 Corinthians 15, Paul says, I delivered to you as of first importance uh, what I also received. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. There's a summary of the gospel, if you will. He died, he was buried, he was raised. John 3.16, of course, is a very concise, tight verse that pretty much captures it all. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Romans 5.8, God shows his love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. 1 John 4.10, in this is love, not that we've loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. So those would be some examples of summary verses that capture the essence of the gospel. Or what about our verses for this morning in 1 Peter chapter 2? For me, 
they really capture so much of what the gospel, the good news, is all about. So let's stand together and read them in honor of God's word. Read them with me. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. For you were straying like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Please be seated. We're going to spend the rest of our time this morning just sort of unpacking those two verses out of 1 Peter. Um, if you are a guest this morning or haven't been here in a while, this is essentially what we do at West Hills. We generally take a book of the Bible work our way through it and just simply allow the Word of God to guide our path and teach us. Uh, we took a few weeks break for the holidays and then to begin the new year with some special messages, but we're back in First Peter this morning, just these two verses. And I sent out a Facebook note to all of you, said, you know, read the verses, familiarize yourself with them. If you're really up to snuff, you might even memorize those two verses. And so uh, I think you're going to find that they just have an awful lot to say to us. Let me pull out four main truths that Peter gives us from 1 Peter 2, 24 and 25. First of all, just the simple fact, he bore our sins. Verse 24, he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, on the cross. Now that's good news. He himself, he didn't send someone else to do it. He couldn't send someone else. There was no one else to send. It couldn't be Moses, it couldn't be Elijah, it couldn't be any of the prophets, it couldn't be all of the prophets combined. There was no one else who could do what needed to be done. Someone had to bear our sins. He himself did it. Now under the old covenant, the priests would offer sacrifices to atone for the sins of the people. But the priests had their own sins, right? They had their own sins to atone for. And so they were, they were offering sacrifices first for their sins and then for the sins of the people, um, not Jesus. The writer of Hebrews says it this way, for it was indeed fitting that we should have such a high priest, holy, innocent, unstained, separated from sinners, exalted above the heavens. I mean, look at those qualifiers. Look at those. No one else could come, up, come with those credentials. Holy, innocent, unstained, separated from sinners, exalted above the heavens. And he goes on. He has no need, like those high priests, to offer sacrifices daily, first for his own sins, and then for those of the people, since he did this once, once, for all, when he offered up himself. And then in chapter 9, he has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to do what? To put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. <coughs> he himself bore our sins. I have to believe that Peter had Isaiah 53 in mind when he wrote these two verses. Isaiah 53, surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Verse 11, he shall bear their iniquities. Verse 12, he bore the sin of many. He carried it. He took it away from us. Carried it himself. He himself did this. Hebrews 9 essentially says the same thing. Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many. See, friends, he bore your sins. He carried the massive, unbearable weight of your sins. He took it off of your shoulders and laid it upon himself. All of it. So that the weight of your sins wouldn't crush you. See, I don't know about you, but my sins crush me. They, they, they just have a tremendous weight to them. They, they bear you down. He bore your sins, plural, the multitude upon multitude of sins that you've committed over the course of your life. The sins of yesterday, the sins of today, and the sins of tomorrow. The sins of actively doing wrong things and passively failing to do what is right. 
the sins of the mind, the sins of the heart, the sins of the mouth, the sins of the hands, the sins of the feet. You've got several extensive lists of sins given to us in the Bible. Let me review them for you. Jesus said, Mark 7, from within, out of the heart of man, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. Paul says in Romans, talking about people in general, they were filled with all manner of unrighteousness, evil, covetousness, malice, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, maliciousness. They are gossips, slanderers, haters of God, insolent, haughty, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, foolish, faithless, heartless, ruthless. My goodness. Galatians 5, the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. So which of those are yours? Or maybe I should reword it. Are there any up there that haven't been yours at one time or another? He himself bore your sins, all of them. He didn't just bear some of them, friends. He didn't just bear the little ones and leave the big ones for you to figure out for yourself. He didn't leave some for you or somebody else to take care of on your behalf. Notice how in Psalm 32, David expresses the joyful, liberating release that comes from knowing that your sins have been completely taken care of. Psalm 32, blessed, which means, oh, the happiness is many times over. Blessed is the one whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord counts no iniquity in whose spirit there is no deceit, no need to hide. That's, that's what that means. It means no need to hide because your iniquity has been covered. For when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. There's the weight of sin. You groan when, you, when sin is upon your shoulders. Day and night, your hand, your good hand, nevertheless, your hand was heavy upon me because of my sin, my strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. You see, here's what you need to understand. Either Christ bears your sins for you, or you bear them yourself. There is no other option. Either Christ bears all of your sins for you, or you bear all of your sins yourself. And then here's the deal. He is able to do that, and you're not. You can't. And frankly, why would you want to? Uh, why would you want to carry, if I can illustrate, why would you want to carry boxes and bins and trunks and, and, and containers filled with your sins and be responsible for them yourself? Uh, I, as I was thinking this through, I, I, I picture the semi-trailers that get parked out front here during Operation Christmas Child Collection Week. And hundreds of boxes, you know, dozens of shoe boxes are packed into a, a big box. Hundreds of those boxes are then loaded on to the semi. Picture those boxes being filled with all the sins that you've committed over the course of your life. You say, well, Gary, I don't think I have that many. How about just one sin a day? That's 365 sins a year. <coughs> Now, for me, at my age, that would be 23,796 sins for me to bear myself. And I don't know about you, but one sin a day doesn't even come close. I would guess I'm more in the hundred or thousand sin a day category when you think of all the times that, that you offend God in some fashion. I'll let you crunch the numbers for your life and see what you come up with, whether you would fill a semi-trailer or a couple of them with your sins. And Jesus says, let me take them. 
All of them. That's why I died. That's why I did that. I will take all of your sins, not some, not the little ones, not the ones that, that are sort of medium range, all of them. And then David continues back in Psalm 32 as to what he did when the weight of sin was bearing him down. He says, I acknowledged my sin to you. I did not cover my iniquity. I said to myself, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. Boy, that's a huge decision to make. And so simple. I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. And then he says, you forgave the iniquity of my sin. Wow. You see why I say that this, these verses are summary of the gospel? He himself bore your sins. Now, someone might say, it just sounds too good to be true. Yeah, it really does, doesn't it? It sounds too good to be true. See, the, the assumption is that in our human nature, the assumption is that if something is too good, it can't possibly be true. We don't know how to handle extreme goodness that is shown to us unless we deserve for it to be shown to us or unless we pay for it. We don't know how to handle extreme goodness that we feel that we don't haven't, haven't earned it in some fashion. I mean, you earn a promotion, you earn a pay raise, you earn a bonus. But unless we've earned it and somehow paid for it ourselves, we don't know how to process that. We think there either must be a catch or that somewhere along the line, we're going to have to pay for this. After all, there's no such thing as a free lunch, right? You see, friends, I'm pretty convinced because I've, I've wrestled with this myself over the, over the years. Deep, deep down, if the truth be told, we just don't know how to handle gospel. It's too good to be true. And so we, we try to come up with some way to, to prove that we're worthy, to earn it, to deserve it, to show God, I'm really not as bad. I'm really not all that bad. I, I, I know you had to die for my sins, but I really have a lot to offer you. And then we try to work it off or serve more or give more money to the church or whatever it happens to be to, to prove to God that we are worth it all. We don't know how to handle gospel. We don't know how to handle what your Bible proclaims, the news that Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. Now don't miss the second half of that verse. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. And so Peter's telling us that our sin problem is twofold. There is both the presence of sins that you've committed and there is the power of sin that we must contend with. The presence of sins, little things, you know, all those things that you can specify, I did this, I failed to do this, I said this, I shouldn't have said that, I thought, I had this thought, sins, but then there's the power of sin in and over your life. And Christ's death, Peter is saying, Christ's death not only addressed your thousands of sins, it conquered the power of sin in the life of the believer. You see, friends, before, before coming to Christ, you were not able not to sin. You got that? Before knowing Christ, you were not able not to sin. But in Christ, you are a new creation so that the power of sin no longer reigns and rules in your life. That doesn't mean you'll never sin again as a Christian. You know that that's not true. That's why you confess your sins. But what it does mean is that you no longer have to follow the passions of your old nature. 
You don't have to go there anymore because you have a new power inside of you so that you don't have to obey its voice. Peter says, he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. So you die to this realm, the realm of sin, and you begin living to a whole new realm, the realm of righteousness. Romans 6, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin, in the realm of sin, so that grace may abound? Boy, if I just keep sinning, I'll experience more grace. And Paul says that's ridiculous. How can we who died to sin still live over here? We don't have to. In fact, it would be wrong if we stay in that camp. We now belong to a new realm, the realm of righteousness. Romans 6, 7, for one who has died has been set free from sin, from the power of sin, from the rule of sin. An old hymn that uh, many of you probably grew up with, Charles Wesley's hymn, And Can It Be, really hard to sing, parts of it, but incredible lyrics. Let me just read one, one stanza for you. Long my imprisoned spirit lay, fast bound in sin and nature's night. Thine eye diffused a quickening ray. I woke, the dungeon flamed with light. My chains fell off, my heart was free. I rose, went forth, and followed thee. That's the liberating release of knowing that you are no longer bound by the chains of sin. You don't have to live there anymore if you're in Christ. And so Paul says in 6.11, Romans 6.11, so you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. <clears throat> Therefore, let not sin reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteous. Present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments of right. Your eyes, your ears, your tongue, your lips, your hands, your feet. Present all of yourself to God for in as instruments for righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you since you are not under law but under grace. And so brothers and sisters, that's just incredible news. You just need to park yourself there in that, in that 24th verse. Remind yourself of that truth every day. He has borne all your sins. And then Peter says the second thing, he heals your brokenness. He, he bears your sins. Secondly, he heals your brokenness. Verse 24, the second half, by his wounds you've been healed. By his wounds, you've been healed. Well, that's good news again. But to know just how good, you need to know what kind of healing he's talking about here. And this is an example of the kind of verse that can be taken out of context. You know, a text taken out of its context becomes a pretext. Okay, uh, it becomes a false excuse. It becomes a justification for believing something that isn't true. You take, a, you take a text out of its context, it becomes a pretext, a way for you to, to build an argument for something that is not true. Okay? There are those who, for example, would latch onto this verse and say, see, God wants for all of his people to be physically healed. By his wounds we are healed. It's, it's obviously a promise that we just need to claim, some people would say. Now let me just say, I'm all for God healing people. We pray for healing here at West Hills, and we see people get healed. We have folks in our church family who have experienced God's healing power. We believe, my wife and I and my family, we believe it was the Lord who healed our Jesse of leukemia many years ago when our doctor put his life expectancy in the eight to 10 year range. He's now 38 years old, praise God. Or Brian West, he was diagnosed with kidney cancer and then went into his lungs, and he was given two years, 12 months to live. It's been eight years. Praise God. And there can be other stories throughout this room. And so we believe that God sovereignly, graciously chooses to heal some of his children some of the time. And all of his children will be healed ultimately. 
when we get to go and be with the Lord when, when we die and he gives us our glorified bodies. But friends, we also know of many instances when God hasn't and doesn't always heal faithful Christians who love the Lord and who seemingly die prematurely from our perspective. They're killed in a car accident, what, what have you, whatever the case may be. As an, so you, what I'm saying is you can't yank Bible verses out of their context in order to try to prove your point or build a false case. And this verse would be a classic example of that. By his wounds you are healed. You have been healed. What does it mean? Well, again, he's drawing on Isaiah's prophecy of the suffering servant in Isaiah 53. Where, where Isaiah uses parallel statements for the purpose of, of emphasis, which means he says the same thing twice, but the second time he says it differently than the first. And so Isaiah 53, verse 5, he was pierced for our transgressions. Let me say it again, he was crushed for our iniquities. Pierced and crushed, transgressions and iniquities. Saying the same thing, just driving it home. Double force. You see, the entire chapter is about the coming Messiah who would come and suffer for our sins. He was addressing your spiritual ailment. He was addressing your cancerous spiritual condition due to your iniquities and sins and transgressions. He wasn't pierced for our physical healing, friends. He wasn't crushed in order to cure cancer or Alzheimer's. He was pierced in order to deal with your willful rebellion and deliberate flouting of God and his laws and commandments that he gave you for your good. He was crushed to remedy the bentness. You, mean, you got this, you've got this bentness of your, of your will and your life. You're bent in the wrong direction. Your nature has been perverted, distorted, damaged. He was crushed to remedy that. Well, then you look at the second pair of statements in Isaiah 53, <clears throat> and they're just like the first. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. With his wounds we are healed. Chastisement, wounds, healed goes with peace. Chastisement that brought us peace or the chastisement that brought us healing with his wounds, we are healed. With his wounds, we are given peace. The punishment that took the form of our Lord being wounded and pierced and crushed and as a result, as a result of that, we are healed of our greatest affliction, the cancer of our sin. With his wounds, we have been healed. Psalm 147, verse 3, he heals the brokenhearted, he binds up their wounds. And so as a result, what's true now? Now we have peace with God. Peace with God. We've been justified by faith, all because of what Christ did on the cross. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And so I would just simply say to you, you need to repeat to yourself every single day, since I have been justified by faith, I have peace with God through my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That is true of me. And I will just say that is the only way you will ever find peace. That is the only way you will ever find peace. If you think you'll find peace by serving more or being in church 52 weeks this year or, or faithfully giving a tithe or a double tithe to God's church or whatever is on your list of goodness, if you think that's how you'll find peace, you're, you're sorely mistaken. You will only find peace by finding yourself covered and wrapped in the precious blood and righteousness and saving power of Jesus Christ. The third thing that Peter tells us about our Lord, he shepherds your wandering heart. He shepherds your wandering heart. Verse 25, for you were straying like sheep. You were straying like sheep, but now have returned. You've returned to the shepherd. Straying like sheep. You know, of all the animals in the animal kingdom, 
Peter says that we humans can be most likened to wandering sheep. Make you feel good? And it's not just Peter, by the way. The, the whole of Scripture gives testimony to this, to this truth. Frankly, I think we would all be, would prefer to be compared to some other creature in the animal kingdom. Maybe strong like an ox or brave like a lion or wise like an old owl, but straying like lost sheep. I mean, some want to put us in the same category as the monkey or the ape. The Bible, frankly, says if only that were true. You might be much, much better off. But no, you are more like sheep than apes or monkeys. Now, as I understand it, I've never owned a sheep, never plan on it. But as I understand it, there are three Ds that essentially characterize sheep. Dumb, dirty, and defenseless. Okay? I mean, dumb. Sheep apparently aren't very smart. They don't have a good sense of direction. They don't seem to realize when they've been separated from the flock. They don't realize when they've wandered off and they pick up their head and, oh, where is everybody, you know? Um, they just kind of munch their way into a different zip code. <laughs> They're dumb. I'm sorry, but that's true. They're dirty. Of course, lots of animals are dirty, but it doesn't help the sheep's reputation any that they don't even have that going for them. They smell, and then they're defenseless. They are unable to protect themselves. Like lots of other animals that protect themselves. I mean, gazelles are fast, lions, tigers, bears, wolverines, badgers, porcupines, even skunks can defend themselves. Our daughter has a three-legged chihuahua that could manage to put up a pretty good fight with anyone who is perceived as a threat. But sheep, not so much. Easy, easy prey. Peter says, you all were straying like sheep. And you say, Gary, why is it that we stray? What is it about our nature that causes us to stray? Why do we tend to wander from good pasture? Why do we tend to wander from the truth? Why do we tend to wander from the fold? That's the reason for my two messages to begin this new year. You will be prone to wander from the fold in 2018. You'll be prone to wander from the truth in 2018. And you go to your Bible, it's been a problem, friends, with human nature from the very beginning. Adam and Eve wandered when they listened to the devil's voice. Cain wandered when he killed his brother. Noah wandered when he got drunk. Abraham wandered when he lied about the identity of his wife. Isaac wandered when he did the exact same thing as dear old dad. Jacob wandered when he stole the blessing that belonged to Esau. Joseph's brothers wandered when they sold their dreamer brother into slavery. David wandered when he committed adultery with Bathsheba. Solomon wandered when he thought it would be a great idea to have a thousand wives and concubines. Jonah wandered when he thought he could run away from God. Simon Peter wandered when he didn't know Jesus. James wandered when he acted hypocritically in front of the Jews. The Galatians wandered when they abandoned the gospel of grace. The Corinthians wandered into a whole boatload of sins. The church in Laodicea wandered into a state of lukewarmness. The church in Ephesus wandered when they lost their first love. See, friends, your Bible is first and foremost a book about God, and secondarily, it is a book about sheep. Lost, wandering sheep. And now, for you and me, the story includes us. We are in that story. We hate to admit it, we hate to deal with it, but in the nicest of terms, we are dumb, dirty, and defenseless. I saw on a message board this week, one of the area, I think it was right up here at Mason Grade School, uh, you know, you put, a, you put a, a great message on these message boards. Pause each day, something, pause each day to remind yourself how awesome you are. I would suggest, no, pause each day to remind yourself how prone to wandering you are. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Lord, I wander every day. My thoughts wander. My heart wanders. 
Some of you, I know, have had episodes of wandering from God. You have. Some of you have had episodes of wandering from the truth. You went over here and you munched on some grass over here because you thought it might be tasty and come to find out it was poisonous. Some of you have wandered from the flock. You come back and God graciously brings you back into the fold because that's the way he is. He's a shepherd who's always out looking for his sheep. There were lots of terrible, terrible shepherds in the Old Testament and boy, they got rebuked. And God said, I'm gonna have to send my, my, my son as a shepherd and he'll, he'll bring in the sheep. And so David writes in Psalm 23, mm, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. In other words, the Lord is my shepherd, I'll be okay. As long as the Lord is my shepherd, I'm gonna be okay. He makes me lie down in green pastures because that's what he does. He leads me beside still waters because that's what he does. He restores my weary, exhausted, tired, beat up soul because that's what he does. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And I would just say to any of you and all of you who are here this morning, if, if, if he is your Lord, that's what he does. And that's what he will do until your dying day. The Lord shepherds your wandering heart. And could I, just, could I just say two things that I believe are on you at that point? Your job, stay close to the shepherd. Stay really close to the shepherd. Fix your eyes on the shepherd. Fix your eyes on Jesus, the, the author and finisher of your faith. Draw near to, draw near to him. Every day, draw near to the shepherd. I mean, there are so many voices out there clamoring for your attention. There are false shepherds who would seek to steal you from the flock. Listen to the voice of the one true shepherd. Listen to his voice. And you will only do that as you're in your Bible. Listen to him. Open your Bible and say, oh, good shepherd, I'm here to listen for your voice today. Let me hear your voice today. Can I give you a second takeaway from this point? Stay close to the shepherd, but secondly, watch out for the other sheep. Watch for those who are listening to other voices. Watch for those who are straying into dangerous terrain. Watch for those who are wandering from the flock. Maybe you haven't seen them in a while. Find out how they're, are they okay? Play the role, you're a sheep, but I'm saying play the role of a caring under shepherd to those people in your world. God's put certain people around your world in your, in your life that he hasn't put in mine. Take care of the sheep that are around you. And if you see one that's starting to go over here, say, okay, come back, come back over here. This is where the good grass is. This is, this is the quiet waters over here. These are the still, this is the good pasture over here. Let's, let's hang together. Pray for your brothers and sisters that they would not wander. And then lastly, number four, the last thing that Peter tells us here, he, is, he, he oversees your soul. He oversees your soul. He not only shepherds your wandering heart, he also oversees your soul. A little bit of parallelism, but I wanna, I wanna make some distinction here. See, our spiritual ancestors were not most concerned about the physical body the way we tend to be today. We're a culture that is pretty obsessed with the body. We're obsessed with physical health and physical appearance. Don't get me wrong, it's great to be healthy. But our spiritual forebears had as their primary concern the soul. It's who you are on the inside, friends. It's your soul. It's, your, it's that part of you that sets you apart from the rest of God's creation. Your, your, your pets don't have souls. 
You do. It's that part of you that, that, that bears the imago Dei, the image of God. God oversees your imago Dei. God oversees your soul. God oversees your spirit. And David seemed to have found his greatest joy and comfort in knowing that God, in whose image he was created, was the overseer of David's soul. Psalm 23.3, he restores my soul. Ah, my goodness, that's so good. My soul gets damaged, my soul gets bruised, my soul gets beat up. How many of you ever, have ever restored something? A piece of furniture, a car, you know, what have you, yeah. It's, 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 kind of, it's kind of great to take something that's just really beat up and in disrepair and bring back its beauty. And we did that with our, the cottage that God blessed us with five years ago. We took this poor little sad house in northern Michigan and, and we restored it and we brought it back to its uh, prettier than it was for a long, long time. To where the neighbors said, oh my goodness, you did such a wonderful job restoring Restoring this place. Uh, another example, uh, every summer up in our little hometown in northern Michigan, it has its own Ekema days. And there's a parade with fire trucks and police cars and more fire trucks and more police cars. And then there's an arts and crafts fair and there's a pancake breakfast. The lions have their beer tents set up and there'll be a 5K run. And then, of course, the big fireworks display. But one of the popular events every year is the antique car show in the Village Park with probably, I don't know, 60, 70 cars that come into town that have all been restored. I think we have a picture of one of those. There it is, Jesse hanging out with. Uh, I mean, what's fun to do is you walk around the park and you talk to the owners who have put so much work into taking something that was old, beat up, scratched, dented, faded paint, torn upholstery, and they've invested hundreds of hours and lots of money into something that then people walk by and admire. And the owners are always glad to tell you the entire story <laughs> about their prized possession. Now friends, God doesn't restore cars. He restores souls that are old and beat up and scratched and dented with faded paint and torn upholstery and he turns it into something that people walk by and they're amazed. And he's always glad to tell the story of his prized possession. Psalm 25, oh guard my soul and deliver me Psalm 31, you have seen my affliction, you have known the distress of my soul. Friends, that is such good news that we have a God who made the heavens and the earth and he watches over and oversees and restores weary, tired, exhausted souls. So put it all together. He bore all your sins. He heals your wounds. He brought you back into the fold when you were wandering and defenseless and lost. He carries you when you need to be carried. He watches over you 24-7 and he won't stop doing that until you take your last breath and he brings you to himself. You just simply need to know that and to rest in that because there are so, so many times in your life when that is all that you can do. Let me close with this. Many of you know the story of our oldest son, Jesse. The Lord created him and blessed us with him. He's with so very special and wonderful blessings in so, so many ways. But then when he was 20 months old, we took him to the doctor for what we thought was just a low-grade fever and a cold, only to find out that he had leukemia. And we began that long, exhausting journey of radiation and chemotherapy and bone marrow aspirations and spinal taps and 
lots of needles and lots of IVs. And friends, much of the time, he was just a very, very tired little boy. You'll see it in this next picture. There were times when he just didn't have the strength. All he could do was rest his tired body in his mom's or his dad's arms, lay his little head on the shoulder of one who loved him more than he could begin to imagine. Now I share that with you. That's you and me with God. Don't you get tired? Don't you grow tired of trying to do it all yourself? Don't, don't you get tired of trying to prove that you're strong enough, that you're not sick? And you say, if I could just lift my head, and I can't, I can't lift my head. The load is too heavy. Life is too hard. I'm too beat up. I've just got, I've got this cancer that's just eating away at me. You're trying to figure out a way to make your life right. You're trying to figure out a way to work off some of your sins or a way to make yourself more presentable to God and to look healthy and strong. Friends, I'm here to tell you, we have a Savior who is all of what you need and more. And he just simply wants to care, carry you. He will restore, he will hold you. He will love you. He will hold on to you. He will cover all of your sins. He will heal your wounds. He will shepherd you. Jesus says, come to me, all who are weary and who carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. This is good news, friends. He bore all your sins. He carried all your sorrows. He was crushed for all your iniquities. And now he says very simply to you, let me shepherd you. Let me watch over you. Let me guard you. Let me protect you. Let me carry you until that day when I bring you home. He loves you that much. And you need to know that. That's good news. Let's pray. Maybe you're here this morning and you've never, ever given it all to Jesus. The invitation is there. Either you carry all of your sins on your own or you let him bear them for you. Either you try to heal your wounds or you let him do the healing. Either you try to shepherd your own life as a lost, defenseless, wandering sheep or you turn to the shepherd and say, would you please shepherd me? I need you to shepherd me. I would just simply invite you to trust him today. Trust him. Say, Lord Jesus, I don't know everything about you, but I've heard enough today to know that I really, really need what Pastor Gary has talked about. I need someone who promises to oversee my life and watch over me and someone who loved me so greatly that he would give his life. And so today, I just want this day to be my day and I, I trust you today. I give my life to you because you gave your life for me. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna try to carry my sins any, anymore. They're just way too heavy. And Lord, I'm tired. I'm so tired. I wanna rest my head on your shoulder. Would you do that today? Let today be your day to experience God's grace. Receive Him. Trust Him. Believe in Him.
if today was your day to receive Christ, please let me know as you walk out today. Just shake my hand and say, today was my day. Father, for the rest of us, thank you that by your grace and your goodness, many of us have come to know you. But we would just confess to you, we forget so easily that you are all that we need. So we try to prove ourselves. And we take on robes of self-righteousness. And they're just filthy rags. That's all they are. And so thank you. Thank you, Father, for covering us with the robe of your Son. Thank you for Christ. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We're able to say that we love you today because of your great, great, great love for us. And now as we share in the Lord's table, we do so with thanks and praise for a Savior who gave his all. We pray in Christ's name.